Welcome to our second lesson in our Introduction to Material Processing course, Part 1. In this lesson, we'll be focused on four key variables, temperature, pressure, environment, and time, and seeing how they impact our material processing. This first part is focused on temperature. Now, temperature might be one of the easiest to see the impact of. Think of solidifying the material. We saw this in an example for our injection molding in Lesson 1. Our polymer powder is placed into our screw nozzle and heated up so that the liquid polymer can be injected into the mold. Then the material is allowed to cool and solidify. At all points during this process, the temperature is being carefully monitored and controlled to ensure that we get the final product we want. But there's more to a temperature's impact on processing than just a liquid to solid phase transition. Take the sintering of ceramics, for example. Ceramics have a very high melting temperature. Melting them down to pour them into molds isn't really cost or energy efficient. Instead, we use a process called sintering. We start by taking ceramic powders and pressing them together. The pressed piece is then heated up to some temperature below the melting temperature to allow the particles to coalesce, getting closer together, shown in the diagram here. The final ceramic piece is denser and more mechanically sound than what we started with. We also have reactions that are driven by temperature. For most aerospace-grade composites, the epoxy resin matrix is cured at elevated temperatures. We also have types of material processes called heat treatments. Here, we're taking advantage of increased diffusion rates at elevated temperatures to alter our material's microstructure. This will have an impact on the material's properties and ultimately its performance. When talking about heat treatments, we're often talking about metals because metals can undergo plastic or permanent deformation. Think of a blacksmith pounding away at metal on an anvil. I'm using this plastic deformation to alter the shape of my material, whether I'm making a sword, nails, or a horseshoe. As I'm plastically deforming this material, I'm introducing defects called dislocations into the metal's crystalline lattice. The more plastic deformation my material undergoes, the higher the dislocation density. Now, these defects have an impact on my material's properties. For example, dislocations can improve a metal's hardness, but only up to a point. Too many dislocations can be a problem. We don't have time to go into the details right now, but controlling a lattice's density of dislocations and how they diffuse through the crystalline lattice is critical. We can control both the density and the motion of these dislocations through heat treatments. We're going to spend some time here looking at an example of a heat treatment because it's a good demonstration of the impact that temperature can have on material processing and how this influences the properties and ultimately the use of our material. Showing right now on the screen a phase diagram of an aluminum copper alloy system. A phase diagram shows the phases of material that are found at equilibrium based on temperature, pressure, and the composition of the system. We can see at room temperature, I form two phases, alpha and theta. This is due to the almost complete lack of solubility of copper atoms within my aluminum crystal lattice at low temperatures. Now, with this system, I can use this to my advantage through a process called precipitation strengthening. For our example, we'll start with a 4 atomic percent copper alloy, notated here. If I heat up my alloy to above 500 C, I will have a solid solution of alpha, since I have improved solubility of copper in the aluminum lattice at elevated temperatures. I can rapidly cool or quench my alloy, creating a supersaturated solution of alpha. Now this is not a staple phase. We don't see it on our equilibrium phase diagram. And we know that the copper does not want to sit within this aluminum lattice due to the decreased solubility. So what I'm able to do is hold or age my alloy at some slightly elevated temperature, say around 200 degrees C. Here I have improved diffusion, so my copper can precipitate out of the aluminum lattice. This will do two things. One, it'll lower the energy of my crystalline system overall. And two, it creates precipitate particles of copper within my aluminum lattice. 
these precipitates impede the diffusion of dislocations, therefore strengthening my material. Now, the composition of my material hasn't changed. I've had a solid material throughout this entire process. There is no melting or solidification that occurred. Instead, I took advantage of faster diffusion at higher temperatures and solid-to-solid -solid phase transitions to strengthen my material. Now, we've seen that temperature can do a lot for us during processing. It helps us alter the shape of materials, and it can even help us improve the properties of our materials. But we need to be mindful of what temperature our materials will experience during their final use. Let's go back to our aluminum copper system as an example. If I was processing, my final processing step of my material was around 200 degrees C to create these copper precipitates. But my final part will be used at around 550 degrees C. These copper precipitates will simply diffuse back into the lattice. I will have undone all of my hard work. And the properties that my material had after processing will not match the properties of my material during use. Therefore, it's critical to know what the final use temperature of your part will be. And consider that when processing your material. In the case of my example where I need a piece that will maintain its properties at 550 degrees C, I won't be using my aluminum copper system. I'll pick a different material that will have better properties at that elevated temperature. Now, this can work in reverse too. Too low of temperatures can have a dramatic and often detrimental effect on our materials. A very famous example of this is the Titanic. Now, a lot of factors went into the sinking of the Titanic. The big one being that it hit an iceberg. But this hit caused a catastrophic material failure that wasn't necessarily expected. This is because the steel of the hull of the ship underwent a ductile to brittle transition. Some steels, depending on their composition, processing, and other factors, will go from being very ductile or malleable materials to very brittle materials at low temperatures. The cold ocean water changed the properties of the material during use, leading to one of the most famous ship disasters in history. And with that, we're going to stop our discussion about the impact that temperature can have on processing. I hope I've been able to demonstrate that temperature is a wonderful variable and something that we can use definitely to our advantage in both changing the shape of our material as well as the properties of our material during processing. And then we need to be mindful of the final temperature our material will experience during use and compare that to the processing temperatures we'll be using. Next, we'll be looking at the impact that pressure has on processing. So stick around.